Greetings and hello, everybody. Welcome in. My name is Lenny Rose and I'm the events manager here at East City Bookshop. It's wonderful to be with you all today. Thanks so much for being here in person and for tuning into our live stream if you're watching that way. Our calendar is always full here at East City Bookshop from our numerous events every month to our 14 different book clubs. Later this week, we're hosting an educator night for local teachers, and in the coming weeks, we'll be hosting a variety of events, and then on April 27th is Independent Bookstore Day and our eighth birthday. We'll be having a day full of festivities, flash sales, and giveaways. All the information about our upcoming events, book clubs, and Indie Bookstore Day is available on our website. Before we get to tonight's event, some housekeeping details. Number one, if you could take a moment to silence your cell phones, we would appreciate it. Number two, if you need a restroom, it's upstairs past the cash registers and the greeting cards. Uh, number three, if you're watching from home and experiencing any technical difficulties, please let us know in the chat and also where you're tuning in from, and my colleague will be able to respond. Number four, we will have time for questions tonight for both in-person and virtual attendees. So even if you're watching via Zoom, you can participate. Please put those questions in the Q&A feature so that we can see them and can ask on your behalf. And finally, most importantly, if you need to purchase a copy of the book, we have copies available upstairs and we'd be happy to help you out with that. All those copies are upstairs at the register, not on the shelves and can be purchased prior to our signing line. I'm so glad that we are able to be here today to celebrate the release of Dr. Sabrina Schultz's book, The Human Disease, which travels through history and around the globe to examine how and why pandemics are an inescapable threat of our own making. Weaving together a wealth of personal experiences, scientific findings, and historical stories, Schultz brings dramatic and much-needed clarity to one of the most profound challenges that we face as a species. Our author of the evening is Dr. Sabrina Schultz, who is the Curator of Biological Anthropology at the Smithsonian's Nat National Museum of Natural History, where she developed the major exhibit Outbreak, Epidemics in a Connected World. She also has served as a Scientific Commissioner for Related Exhibition at the Musée des Confluences in Lyon, France. Joining her in conversation is Dr. Dennis Carroll. Who has for over 30 years, who has over 30 years of leadership experience in global health and development. Until recently, he served as the director of the U.S. Agency for International Development's Emerging Threats Division, and he currently serves as the chief science officer at URC and is a distinguished professor, professor of faculty of medicine and a senior fellow Tufts University Center for the International Law and Governance. Please welcome our authors of the evening. I did the, uh, we've got, oh, hang on, um, all the time that we, uh, is this going, oh, well, well, okay, while well, we work on that, um, okay, everybody, um, do me a favor, uh, look at your hands, okay, uh, I swear, all right, it'll, it'll be fine, everybody watching, you know, virtually can do this too, just look at the back of your hands, all right, Dennis, thank you, and you should be able to make out the outline of, Touch some bones, all right? Um, there are 27 in total. Uh, you've got these sort of skinny, longish ones that make up your fingers, and there's some funny, bumpy ones that kind of show on your wrist, right? And these are the bones that give our hand a special shape. And the muscles that attach to them give it its strength, okay? Now, if you look at the end of each of these fingers, you've got a hard plate of keratin, which we call a nail. All right, um, and they're nice for decoration, minor pain to pain, uh, but they have an important function too. Uh, they enhance and protect our sensitivity to touch. So now, if you flip over your hand, you can see why, all right? At the end of each finger, you've got a fleshy little pouch, okay? Which happens to contain some of the highest concentrations of sensory receptors in the skin, right? Um, with these pads, we touch everything, okay, and including other pads. So can everybody make some pad-to-pad -pad contact for me right now? Yeah? Okay, good. Yes. Yes, you can, <laughs> because you are human, all right? We are the only species with hands that can do this. Um, it, is, uh, it is our special human ability. I mean, we touch everything. We, we, um, we have a longer thumb. Um, than other 
hoops um, you can take for the fingers, right? And we've also got, um, you know, um, more force with which we can access our fingers, okay? Um, and this is how we explore the world and interact with each other. Now, if you look at your hand one more time, um, I'll tell you what you don't see. Microbes, <laughs> okay? Billions of them, literally, okay? Um, many of them, um, most of them are harmless. Um, quite a few um, can actually help us. But um, some do cause disease, and all of our touches spread them. Unless we wash our hands. All right? So that is what this book is about how we are vulnerable um, to spreading disease um, simply by being human. Okay, but um, you know, even though in the worst case scenario, um, some of these human features can maybe help to create or prolong a pandemic, uh, the good news is that we are largely in control by understanding uh, these risks. We can make better decisions about personal and public health. So, okay, well, um, so what are these features, right? It's a, like a 300 page book. So I can't um, <laughs> talk about everything, but I think that a good way to distill these, uh, these um, some of these ideas uh, is into three basic categories of risk, right? Okay. There we go. Um, biology, behavior, and beliefs. Can everyone hear me now? Better? Better, better? Okay. Okay, so our hands are part of biology, right? Um, and as an example of how we can use them to spread disease, uh, let's use the example of Mary Mallon. All right, you all probably, or most of you would know her as Typhoid Mary. Um, she was a cook. She was a household cook for wealthy families um, around New York City in the early 1900s. And she was also a chronic carrier of bacteria that caused a very serious illness called typhoid fever. Um, that meant that she was infectious, but she um, did not show symptoms. And so Mary uh, shed these bacteria when she used the bathroom. Uh, and then she carried them with her um, on her hands, feeling fine, into the kitchen. She used her hands to prepare and serve food. Um, and uh, that caused a string of outbreaks in the families that ate her meals. <laughs> when public health authorities finally realized what was going on, they arrested and quarantined her um, first for several years and then for the rest of her life. To be clear, Mary did not think that she was hurting anyone. Okay. She, um, she didn't see how someone who was healthy could make another person sick. And for this reason, she refused to stop cooking. But, you know, she also didn't care to wash her hands. Um, even though people have been doing that for thousands of years, long before any of us knew what bacteria were. And so, well, I think that her story is, you know, sort of interesting fodder for debate about um, personal freedom versus public health. Um, I also think that her legacy um, is a very uh, good example of how small actions can make a big difference. Um, small actions here being washing your hands. Um, now, our hands are part of biology, right? But they're not the only features uh, that spread disease in our body. And I'm actually using another one right now as I speak. And I apologize for the pan for the pun, but yes, as I speak. <laughs> um, you know, all animals have systems of communication, but none come anywhere close to humans um, in terms of their sophistication, right? Our speech is another unique feature of our species, um, partly because we have a low voice box. Um, it's what we call the larynx. It's the green bits here. Um, it's a bit lower than you might find in many other mammals. And also we've got a flatter face. If you could see our, our profile compared to say, uh, uh, that's a chimpanzee, right? Rather, rather projecting, um, you know, and that may not look like a major difference, but I, it is, it is, um, you know, that these, these tubes that, you know, uh, we see they're outlined. I mean, I think that the human one looks like a boomerang. Um, that's like an equal sided L. And if you compare that to a chimpanzee, and I really thought that looked like a hockey stick, um, that configuration that you see in the human being, I mean, that anatomical arrangement combined 
with our supercharged brain allows us to make an endless array of sounds um, and therefore produce just a vast, vast uh, range of words, okay? Um, and unfortunately, um, our speech is also um, a brilliant mechanism through which we spread respiratory pathogens, okay? Like, like COVID-19, like measles, like flu. Um, and I'm just curious, what do you think spreads pathogens more? Speaking or let's say coughing? Dennis, do you have any thoughts on that? All right, who, who thinks speaking? Speaking, anyone? Anyone? Okay, yes, yes, yes. This, the, 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 you all are correct. You raised your hand there. Um, it is speaking. Um, and, you know, it's, it's it, like touching. We speak all the time. Uh, one study showed that he, adult humans use speak an average of like 16,000 words a day. And in this talk, I think I probably used about a thousand. <laughs> and, for, you know, for the folks at home, um, you know, they're, hey, they're safe. Okay. Um, they, my respiratory emissions cannot possibly reach them. And for those of you who were so good to come out tonight, I mean, I really can't say the same. Uh, <laughs> you know, we're a highly social species and we have gathered here tonight as humans like to do. Um, yeah, um, and this is actually where we get to our second category of risk, which is behavior, all right? Um, and so don't get me wrong, you know, I'm, I'm really th thrilled that you all came out here tonight. Um, I'm especially honored because there is no food at this venue, right? <laughs> Um, and I will tell you, I will tell you, um, sharing food and eating together, that's a behavior known as commensality. Um, that is very much a human thing. I mean, we, we love it. Okay. We, we share more food than any other primate. We share it with family members. We, we share with, you know, friends, we share people we don't even really know. Right. Um, and that is something that, you know, until 12,000 years ago, if you think about that, right back when people were. Um, foraging for food, all right? You had to hunt and gather and fish. Okay, that was uh, maybe um, some way of um, protecting against shortfalls, you know, um, sort of, uh, it was an advantage for survival. Now today, we make our food, we produce it mostly by farming, pretty much. Um, yet, sharing food is still something that is incredibly important to us. I mean, for the reason that it expresses our relationships with each other. It's a way by which we express and reinforce um, and I guess um, um, create these feelings of trust and intimacy and kinship, okay? It is, is part of how we connect to each other, both socially and culturally. And unfortunately, when we share meals, you know, um, we can share pathogens too. I mean, some of the earliest evidence of the airborne transmission of SARS-CoV-2 came from restaurants. Um, and, you know, here in the United States, throughout the country, um, you know, adults who tested positive for COVID-19 were twice as likely to have eaten in a restaurant within two weeks before becoming ill. And, you know, I mean, that, it makes sense, right? Okay, like, think about it. You know, you're in, you're in a restaurant, let's say, and you're at a table with your favorite friends. And, okay, if you're wearing a mask, you got to take it down to eat, right? And so you're kind of reducing, you're removing that barrier to your emissions. And then the food arrives, you're probably going to start talking, you know, and that's going to increase your emissions more. And then, you know, uh, maybe some drinks arrive. Okay. And then maybe we'll get louder. All right. And then we <laughs> start talking even more. We're increasing our emissions more. And then, you know, um, we're talking really loudly and we want more food and, hey, let's get more drinks because we want to keep talking. Um, and that is not only increasing our emissions, but our length of exposure to them. Okay, this is a really common <laughs> scenario, as we all know, in a restaurant or a bar. And it is for a lot of people um, an irreplaceable bonding experience, right? Um, but there are ways of doing it more safely, um, make it less risky, at least, you know, um, certainly eating outdoors is a great option, um, or in less crowded, you know, well-ventilated spaces, um, and make no mistake that masks work. And so do mask mandates. In fact, I mean, we've got some studies like one in Germany, uh, showing that a 20 days of mandatory mask wearing almost halved the rate of new COVID infections in one reason, one region. And then in another study in Bangladesh, um, you know, they saw that there was a 30% increase in mask wearing that correlated with a 9% reduction 
in new cases. And so that is just to say that whether it's required or not, you know, this is a valuable tool for lowering respiratory emissions and one that everybody should feel um, comfortable and encouraged to wear, right? Um, but, you know, food sharing, it's, it's, it's involved in another human behavior um, that recognizes and reinforces our social connections. And it's even harder, I think, to give up. Um, and that is caring for and honoring the dead. And, you know, I, we, are, we are the only living species um, that buries its own, actually. And this is a behavior that we see going back at least 80,000 years, almost into human prehistory. Um, and I don't have to tell anybody here about the trauma of the COVID-19 pandemic when people lost loved ones and they couldn't see them, right? Or um, mourn them. And it is um, a heartbreaking situation when actually these final acts of love um, can pro prolong the spread of a disease. And, you know, I think that one of the cruelest pathogens um, in this respect um, is the Ebola virus. Uh, during the 2014 epidemic in West Africa, where more than 28,000 people were infected, um, many of the cases were linked to healthcare work and funerals. It's a disease that preys on compassion because Ebola patients, um, their body fluids can be most infectious at the time of death and um, they can remain infectious for days afterward. So, um, you know, when you combine these viral properties with cultural behaviors that involve touching and kissing and, and washing the dead, um, as is the case in, in some communities in West Africa, you know, you get this public health nightmare. Um, one funeral in Sierra Leone uh, was linked to as many as 365 deaths. And these funeral behaviors, I mean, from, from a health perspective, a public health perspective, you know, they, they're a problem. They need to stop. But, you know, you, you can't change these things by force. And certainly what you can't do um, is to um, take away the opportunity for people to bury their loved ones without giving them another way to honor them, right? And so unfortunately, a lot of families um, experienced or feared a situation where, um, you know, people in masks would come and in trucks and take away the sick and the dead um, without any opportunity to comfort them or say goodbye or really understand what was happening. Right. So a lot of people would not would not be OK with that. And many people in West Africa weren't. Um, and so what had to happen was that, you know, local religious and traditional leaders stepped in to play a important role in developing and promoting safer burial practices that were acceptable um, to these communities. And they included modifications like um, sprinkling water um, over the deceased instead of washing them, for example. And and that worked, um, that worked, uh, those interventions. Um, and it is the people who accepted them who, who broke the epidemic curve, right? And this story of the West African Ebola epidemic actually highlights the third category of risk that we're talking about, which is beliefs. Um, people, some people believed um, in that situation, for example, that the deceased would actually, um, that they would be unhappy, that they would return, that they might even retaliate if they weren't buried properly, right? So that made those practices even more important. And these beliefs are part of religion, um, which is one of the strongest forces in humanity that convenes people and creates communities all around the world. Um, but, you know, uh, religion can also be a divider. Um, it can be one of the many ways that humans perceive differences between each other in a process that we call othering. The other is anyone outside of one's own group, which can be defined by religion or race or status or nationality. You know, and othering can have a lot of harmful effects, including when it facilitates the spread of a disease um, or justifies the scapegoating of others as its cause. Um, you know what, you know what one of the first responders to an outbreak is? I mean, okay, so what, government, Red Cross, um, xenophobia, um, historically, uh, would be that, uh, for sure. Um, that is the othering of foreigners. Um, and you know, how many people, for example, have heard of the Spanish flu, right? Um, that's what the U S and British press called the influenza pandemic in, in 1918. And the French did it too. Um, you know, they called it in Spain, the French disease, <laughs> 
<laughs> right. And uh, yeah, in uh, in uh, Senegal, it was the Brazilian flu. And in uh, Brazil, it was the German flu. Uh, and, you know, um, well, ironically, it, it might have started in Kansas. <laughs> you know, but this kind of this kind of naming, I mean, this is a quick way to assign blame, you know, and we saw the same tactic during COVID-19 for sure. Um, in, in March 2020, President Trump, he he started calling SARS-CoV-2 the Chinese virus, right? Um, and uh, he did this on Twitter and then hashtag Chinese virus skyrocketed by like 17,000%, right? And unfortunately, you know, this, this was part of a huge increase in anti-Asian hate in the US that we saw occur within the next 18,000 months, more than 10,000. 18 um, anti-Asian incidents uh, were reported uh, during that time. And like the pandemic, I mean, I'm sorry to say that it's not over, you know, um, a recent survey, like just within the past few weeks um, reported that Asian Americans in New York City um, had, uh, had, had, had experienced, um, over half of them had experienced um, an incident of uh, harassment or threat or uh, physical attack in 2023 alone. Right. And this is not the first time that Asian Americans and specifically Chinese Americans have been targeted in this way. Um, in the year 1900, plague emerged in the U.S. And uh, the first outbreak was in San Francisco. The first victim was a Chinese man in Chinatown. And so the Chinese were immediately singled out as the source of the problem. Um, and they were, frankly, a really easy target because they had been persecuted since the gold rush, right, in California. In San Francisco, they were already the go-to scapegoat for smallpox. And health officials tried to quarantine Chinatown. They tried to inst institute a, a vaccine mandate for the Chinese only. And none of it worked. Um, to not, it failed to stop the outbreak. And in the end, um, the only thing that did work um, was that uh, one public health officer named Rupert Blue, who later went on to be uh, Surgeon General of the U.S., um, he went after the real culprits in Chinatown, which were rats. <laughs> um, he and his team launched this campaign to uh, rat-proof Chinatown by breaking down and eliminating all the places where they could spread their plague-infected fleas to people. And the outbreak ended. It did. Um, and, and, and when the disease resurfaced a few years later, after the earthquake in San Francisco in 1906, the only part of the city that was unaffected was Chinatown, right? But um, the bacteria that cause <laughs> bubonic plague, I mean, they're, they still exist in the United States. Um, and for the same reason that SARS-CoV-2, I'm sorry, is here to stay, uh, I think. Um, these pathogens are zoonotic. Um, which means that they can be transmitted to people um, and from people to other animals, right? Um, and so as Chinese people were being um, attacked for a spreading plague in San Francisco in the 1900s, rats were spreading that bacteria to squirrels um, all over the East Bay. And so now, um, today, a lot of wild rodents actually um, in a number of Western states carry those bacteria. Um, the, the same ones that caused, you know, the, the, the plague of, of Chinatown um, in San Francisco in the 1900s, as well as the Black Death in the 14th century, right? Um, and likewise, with so much focus on China um, as the source of COVID-19, we've also been helping that virus spread and mutate across the natural world, um, people and, and, and pets and zoo animals and, and wildlife, um, the uh, uh, in one study um, the, in the United States, researchers found that SARS-CoV-2 was transmitted to white-tailed deer um, over a um, hundred times from 2021 to 2022, uh, and at least three instances it was transmitted back to people in a mutated form, um, which um, really complicates um, prevention and treatment, you know, for the future. And so events like these, um, those illustrate the importance of recognizing the interconnectedness of human and one environmental health, which is a concept we call One Health. Um, and we're happy to talk more about that um, in the Q&A. Um, it's the kind of thinking that prioritizes disease surveillance in wildlife as well and, and, and livestock as well as in people. And it is one of the ways that we can reduce our zoonotic disease risks uh, by focusing on connections rather than divisions. And so 
I will close <laughs> by saying that I've studied pandemics now for a decade. And um, I've come to a couple conclusions that I hope that you take away from this talk. Um, one, that humans create pandemics through some, uh, well, with the help of some special, unique human features. But two, we can reduce our risks by using some of our unique human advantages. No other species can innovate as we do um, or has the brain power that we have. And there are very few that are as adaptable to change. And so, um, you know, I argue that uh, to a large extent, our pandemic future is in our human hands and it just depends on what we do with them. So with that, I will, uh, I will, uh, I guess, um, Invite Dennis to join a conversation with me <laughs> about all of this. And I think Dennis, um, I would, uh, I'd like to ask you first, cause you read the book, right? Um, what I miss, what else do people know that that's in it? Then what, why should they buy it? What else, uh, what else could I talk about? First off, thank you for uh, your opening. I think it deserves, I have, I have got one. Got one? Okay. Um, Look, what, you, what you've heard is sort of a discussion about a body of work that Sabrina and I have been involved in over the last uh, 10 years or so, but I've been involved in this space for 30 years. If you heard me talk about it, you would have heard someone talk about the virus or the bacteria. What's really wonderful about Sabrina as a social anthropologist and she's talking it through the lens of the human experience, both as the propagator, right? Yeah. The source of the problem. The, the problem isn't the virus. The problem isn't the bacteria. They've been there well before we were around. Uh, the problem is our footprint on this planet and talking, having a chance to talk about in the most simplistic, but the most impactful ways just how that footprint is so disruptive. And what the scientific community at large sort of um, scolded itself for during the, during the um, SARS-CoV-2 pandemic was our absolute inability to communicate, our inability to really speak to the population in a way that helped them understand the problem but more importantly, help them understand the solutions. My experience with Sabrina, if any of you had gone to the um, exhibit at the Natural History Museum, yes? I mean, Outbreak. Uh, outbreak, <laughs> yeah. Epidemics in a connected world. Well, <laughs> that was my first introduction, sort of pulling me out of the gobbly speak of the scientific community yeah. into the speak of, someone who understands the human nature, the mm. human dynamic. Yeah. Uh, and it was forcefully sort of presented to me because mm -hmm. you know, you spent two or three three years sort of thinking and designing and preparing that. Yes? Well, yeah, I mean, like you came on board. So Dennis was an advisor for this exhibition. I was the lead curator. Um, it opened in 2018 before um, the COVID-19 pandemic and was shut down by it, which is very ironic and kind of sad, but uh, it reopened, you know, and <laughs> to a totally different audience. Nonetheless, I think that Dennis, you probably came on board 2015 or 16. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we had the, so the idea came from our colleague, our mutual colleague, Dan Lucy, yeah. as an, uh, an infectious disease physician who was actually working in West Africa, um, treating Ebola patients um, during that epidemic that I was talking about um, there. And um, yes, for that long, I mean, it was a period of about four years, um, three or four years that the team in the museum and then a whole host of supporters from different disciplines outside of the museum, um, people like Dennis and, and, and so many others like Dan um, helped us work through these ideas and develop that content. Absolutely. Right. But what you brought to that process, and this is really to the credit of the Smithsonian at large. They've broken down the museum experience into really almost, they've pixelated the oh, yeah. experience, right? Well, I, yeah. Right? So right about can, it. Let's say first thing they do is that they have a vision for people going through a number of different chambers, different rooms. 
and they understand how many minutes or seconds the average, what that flow looks like. They also understand what's their retention capability in each of these rooms. And then how do you frame something that for someone who is not an expert, for them to walk out of there knowledgeable, mm-hmm. right? I mean, mm-hmm. that's, yeah. there's an art form in that that totally just blew me away. Just how not only um, systematic it was and how thoughtful it was, but ultimately, and this is my experience, ultimately how impactful it was. I, after the exhibit opened, I went and I was taking uh, a colleague, uh, Larry Brilliant, who you may know. And Larry and I were walking through the exhibit. And at one point, there was this wonderful uh, game where you could prevent the next pandemic or cause it, right? I mean, it was an well, interactive You could fail. You, yeah. you could lose this game. Yeah. yeah it was an interactive game. It was really bad. <laughs> which was great. So Larry and I are standing there. And at one point, this fellow comes up and he says, are you Dennis Carroll? And I looked at him, terrible with faces, names. I'm going, where did I meet this guy before? Well, it turns out I I have a picture on the wall as you come in. I'm one of the people that you would see along the way. And this man was looking at everything as he was going through. And he saw that picture. And three minutes later, he sees me. And he connected. He began to ask me the most thoughtful, insightful questions. And we had a wonderful discussion. This man was on vacation with his family of three, two children and his wife from Pennsylvania. He was a trucker, obviously not a person well versed in this whole discussion around outbreaks. But the exhibit brought that level of distillation and familiarity that when he walked out of there, I can guarantee you his reaction to SARS-CoV-2 was fundamentally different than if he had not gone to that exhibit. Yeah. And that really speaks to the power of being able to talk in a language that resonates with people's understanding and their own reference points. Scientists are terrible, right? <laughs> a biological scientist, you know. Yeah. Uh, from the universe that I come from, mm-hmm. as opposed to, say, social anthropologists, mm-hmm. scientists mm-hmm. who can talk about fingers, oppositional thumbs, the yeah. power of community. That's not something that resonates. So I would say that your book added a dimension to the discussion, which is woefully underattended to. It, as you, t- as yeah. the title says, it's the human disease. This isn't a virus disease or a bacteria disease or a fungus disease. This is a consequence of our own making, which comes back to the very point that you make. It's our making, which is also our ability to solve it by changing our practices, Mm -hmm. changing our behaviors, maybe better understanding our beliefs in ways that resonate. Well, thank you, Dennis. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's um, absolutely, you know, a, a lot of what you said there, um, I think is, is great. I mean, I write, I, I do the, the, the creation, the development of the exhibit sort of frames the book, if you read it. Um, that's how I open, you know, with sort of everything shutting down. <laughs> and, you know, sort of, I, I asked the very question of myself in the book, um, you know, um, it, whoever, whoever saw that exhibit, and at that point, millions of people had, you know, um, Will it make any difference in how people react to and think about what's ahead of us um, at, at that point in 2020? And it's hard to say. You never know. You never know. Um, certainly, we hope so. The idea of putting faces, you know, and stories and quotes from people like Dennis in the exhibit was to not just personalize uh, the content a little bit, but also to um, make people aware of the many different disciplines that are involved in this kind of work. I mean, I. I don't know how many different disciplines are represented in the information that I put into this book. I mean, it is vast. There are chapters about misinformation. There are chapters about distrust. There are chapters about stigma, you know, um, that I didn't really touch on in my talk. Um, and in, in, in so many ways, you know, again, looking at what we do specifically as humans um, to spread disease. Viruses don't spread themselves, <laughs> right? They, they can't. Um, and so recognizing that, but also I think having a bit of grace and understanding that these are human behaviors. We are being human. 
when we're doing a lot of these things. It makes it harder, um, but that doesn't absolve us completely from responsibility to do something about it because we are so smart and we are so competent and capable um, and we are empowered to do more about it. You know, the viruses aren't, aren't coming to get us. <laughs> um, the bats, I mean, all the animals and all of the, the, the sources of these diseases, I mean, we're going to them and we're, we're helping things spread. Yeah, and the reason we're going to them is, look, when I was born on this planet, there were about 2.2, 2.3 billion people. We're at 8 billion people. Okay. And go back, you know, to the numbers that uh, Sabrina was talking about, you know, 80,000, 100,000. Homo sapiens appeared, you know, 250, 300,000 years ago. And it, right. And it, <laughs> and it took us almost the entirety of that time period to hit a billion. We hit that yeah. in the 19th century. In the 20th century, we added 6 billion people. It's stunning. And that increase meant that our settlements were larger, our disruption of the ecosystem around us for farming, you know, whether it's crops or livestock, our need to um, drive energy to be able to create the new technologies. I mean, we just totally disrupted the ecosystems around us. And that is what brought us, that's what's brought us in close proximity to these viruses, these bacteria. They're out there in a natural habitat. Largely, they've been over there, we've been over here, but now we are intermingling in ways which have created this combustible uh, situation. So even as we look at COVID, uh, increasingly through a rear view mirror, people, you know, I, I went back, you talked about 1918. And I went back and did some, you know, looked at 1918, but I particularly looked at it. What were people saying about 1918, yeah. 1919, and 1920, 1921? They were saying absolutely nothing. They washed it out of their brains. They didn't want to deal with it. There, if you've been watching the news over the last couple of weeks, we are again being reminded that COVID-19 isn't the end of the story. It's just the most recent event in that story. There's another virus, you talked about respiratory viruses, the H5N1. Anyone who sort of um, read the newspapers 15 years ago, 2005, almost 20 years ago, that avian influenza virus, which is an enormously lethal virus when it does infect us. Mm -hmm. um, and it got everyone's attention and was our first real global coordinated effort. Mm -hmm. to try and change some of these behaviors impact yeah. that virus is still out there and it has over the last year now spread worldwide it had largely been in, in asia in europe in africa contracted back to asia largely some in egypt now it's everywhere it's in north america it's in south america but most importantly it continues to evolve it continues to adapt so now we have reports of an unprecedented mammalian to mammalian um, sort of cow to cow transmission of this. Yeah. It, it reminds us that these viruses, given the opportunity, the way we bring our livestock close to them or the way we allow wild animals to interact with our livestock populations, mm -hmm. create enormous amount of risk. So everything that Sabrina is telling us now isn't simply about SARS-CoV-2 or Ebola or the plague in San Francisco. It's immediately applicable to what's going to happen at the rest of this year, next year, and the year to come. I read a lot of, a lot about chickens in one of the chapters. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I do. I do. Um, I, I'm fascinated, actually, by the, the uh, boiler chicken. Uh, which is an animal that we created through domestication. Um, and now there are far more of them than us. Okay, like three to one. People like 26 billion or something like that. It's and 19 billion in China alone. Yeah, right. And um, that's not normal to have that many so um, abundant in a, such a short time period everywhere on the planet. And so there's, you know, if anyone hears about or knows about the Anthropocene, which is something else I read about, uh, anthropologists love it. Um, but, um, you know, geologists, not so much. Uh, in any case, it, as a concept, I think it's very useful um, to talk about a human age, right. a, a, an age where humans have replaced nature as a force of change globally. 
And this is one of the markers where we we, we see that. Um, and you know, just just in terms of the quantity um, and richness of like the 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 bones, the remains that you get of these animals. But what I write about in the book is like that is a signal of the kind of pandemic risks that we were creating at this period of time. Um, just exploded, you know, in, in the last several decades, I guess, from the mid 20th century. Right. Um, it's the way that, that you know, we are we are today, um, where, as Dennis had you know referred to, um, if people aren't aware, I mean, you know, we have uh, we have uh, wild waterfowl, right? So, you know, birds, you know, um, that are natural reservoirs of, uh, of, the, of these amazing avian influenza viruses, but they can infect domestic um, uh, birds that get closer to us. And there are so many of them that, um, you know, these diseases can spread. And then what's really scary is, you know, if they're highly pathogenic, they'll kill off a lot of birds, um, but that doesn't mean they'll infect us or harm us. But if they can infect a mammal, which now they're doing, these, you know, some of these viruses are doing, and if a virus then mutates to be able to be transmitted by a mammal to another mammal, which is, you know, something we haven't really seen before, is just a step away from us. And Dennis has actually talked about this as well. I write about in the book um, that we were in the exhibit. We were doing a tour um, for a group and um, you had this really great um, metaphor for talking about that kind of risk. You remember what it was? I do. Go okay. ahead. Well, no, I, I think- No, well, no, no. I think, you know, I've heard- it. Okay. All right. Well, um, it's in the book, but basically Dennis um, likened um, what we're doing um, with these risks or with these viruses to like playing the slot machine. You know, because there had been a recent study showing that there were three mutations that were needed for a particular virus to get really scary and really bad. And it's like, you know, we're just keep putting in quarters. And, you know, if we hit those three cherries, you know, that is all it's going to take um, to have another situation that can very quickly get out of control. And it was this particular avian influenza virus. Um, yeah. Which, I mean, just think about it. For as disruptive and painfully impactful as SARS-CoV-2 has been and continues to be um, the mortality rate it's it's hard to estimate but it's certainly less far less than a percent of those infected ever um, died from it mm -hmm. this particular virus is in excess of 50 percent so you know this this notion that the more opportunities we give these viruses to spread and move around, particularly our livestock and in people, even if they are not causing illness, every time they infect, they replicate. And every time they replicate, you know, there, there's two things that are going on. They're remarkably promiscuous. That is, when they replicate, they'll be doing it all in sort of randomly, but there'll be lots of them doing it at the same time. They'll swap genetic material. So your big fear is to have someone who is infected with an uh, H3N2. That's the annual, one of the annual influenza viruses, which means it already has fine-tuned its genetic profile to be a tremendously efficient human-to-human -human transmitter. You put that same virus in a cell with an H5N1 virus, which does not have that human-to-human -human transmitting capability, but on the random chance that it does infect a person, that person has a better chance of dying than not. You put them both in the same cell, which is what will happen in influenza seasons, the opportunity for them to swap genetic material and for the H5 to walk away with that domain that transmits highly efficiently well, that's why paying attention to beliefs, right, and behaviors is ultimately the only way we're going to stop putting the quarters in the slot machines. Those mm -hmm. quarters are nothing more than a metaphor for our behaviors and practices. We keep touching, we keep creating, breathing, and we keep creating opportunities for bad events to happen. So it's yeah. ultimately, it's our problem. It's not the virus's problem. And it's up to us to really yeah. pay yeah. attention to what Sabrina has talked about in terms of behavior yeah. and practices well, and beliefs. Thank you, yeah. And the beliefs are not just religious beliefs, you know, um, as I as I you know talked about, it's also these ideas about how we perceive difference. Um, you know, I focused on xenophobia, 
Um, race is another one um, for which anthropologists have a lot to answer um, in terms of creating false ideas about biological difference and, and you know, categories of people. Um, that is not true. Socially, it exists. You know, racism has biological consequences for sure. Um, but these ways that we see that we see and, and sort each other um, are really problematic in these kinds of situations and other beliefs. And you know, I read a whole chapter about misinformation, you know, uh, whether we intend to or not, you know, that we communicate so much and we get things wrong, um, whether we intend to or not. Um, and we are the only species that communicates about the here and now and the over there and in the future, right? We, we, we only we have that kind of complexity to, to our messages. Um, at the same time, we're the only species that miscommunicates um, constantly, you know, and often and sometimes intentionally, you know, and with great harm. And so what people believe, you know, that is a starting point to having conversation. That's really what I hope the book does. I hope it starts conversations like we hoped that and, and, and Dennis talked about, you know, like the, somebody being in the exhibit. Same kind of thing um, to give people information, give them maybe um some some interest or or some way to relate um or um want to learn more um whether or not they buy it or you know whether or not they 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 agree um as well as i think to respect the importance of discussion um as well as to i think um yeah give people give people something to hope for you know you you get to with every chapter, yes, I talk about something that we maybe can't change or, you know, we can control, but is part of who we are. Um, but nonetheless, I, I try to pair, you know, those problems with things we either we can do as individuals or we can do as society, you know, and that's really important to recognize. I no, think. And, yeah. and it is. And one of the really important things when you talk about misinformation, we know that there are people out there that are propagating misinformation for lots of reasons. Where we found ourselves really undercutting ourselves is when we ourselves who know what needs to be said are not saying it well. And I'll give you an example. Early on in the COVID um, pandemic in February, when everyone started to, well, maybe we should be paying attention to it. Or some people were not saying we should pay attention mm -hmm. to it, but by and large, there was a sense that we should pay attention to it. And one of the quick sort of expressions of what you could do was to wear a mask. Well, immediately, um, the public health community became concerned that there'd be a run on masks, which would put health workers at risk. Because there, there was a, we did not have stockpiles of adequate supplies, so the messaging that came out was not protect yourself by putting a cloth over your face, a bandana or something like that. It was you don't need a mask. And when the supplies issue became not an issue and tried to pivot back, wear a mask, well, that earlier statement that you don't need a mask came back to haunt it and we never dug ourselves out of that hole it then became one of the early examples of sort of a political dynamic mm -hmm. um, and that was self-imposed that's self-inflicted yeah um, we have to be very clear why we say we could have clearly said masks uh, right now we need to protect a n95 or whatever type of respiratory mask you're going to use for our high risk uh, health care professionals goes at, at we have to keep those systems functioning. But everyone else can protect themselves by making their own mask, all of which would provide maybe not as great protection as N95, but far more protection absent a mask. And we just messed up on that. And we'll mess up, <laughs> we'll mess up in the future unless we huh. pay clearer attention. Well, yeah. Yeah. Right? Um, and actually I'm gonna signal that maybe we can take questions if people have them. Or we can we can keep. Talking. Anyone have a question at this point? Okay. Um, feel okay. Um, Cecily. <laughs> Full disclosure: this is this is my cousin Cecily. <laughs> oh, um, I can repeat your question if you want to ask it. Okay. Um, 
Um, one of my questions is, so obviously, just anecdotally, a lot of kids when they were going to school during COVID, they were wearing masks. Obviously, you have COVID and you have other types of respiratory disease, but viruses yeah. that can be transmitted, and you don't want virus spreading and causing big problems. But there are also things like the flu that sometimes help to build immunity. So having everybody wear masks all the time, sometimes we need to build immunity so that we're not so vulnerable to get sick from just any yeah. So how do you put the balance there? It's a really good question. Oh, and thank you, Mel. Um, <laughs> so Susley basically pointed out that there's a tension between protecting your, you know, uh, preventing exposure to a disease like COVID-19 um, and then also just allowing, you know, a, a natural infection and, you know, um, acquired immunity to develop um, as you're exposed to other diseases, right? Um, or just in general, you know, sort of how, how do you balance protecting versus sort of, you know, just letting your body do its thing, I suppose. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, a perfect example of that, um, and we're seeing the consequences of it today, of today is the over prescription of overuse of antibiotics, particularly within children. Um, and they never were able to develop the sort of microflora in their systems. And we're now seeing pretty strong correlations between that population that grew up heavily exposed to antibiotics, now having problems with obesity, um, respiratory asthmas. Mm -hmm. So there are consequences by not having, by one, overusing something um, that led to and as, as Sabrina said, not all microbes are our enemies. Right. Um, we have a symbiotic relationship and our biology is extremely dependent on all sorts of, in, in our digestive systems across the board are very dependent on and the inappropriate or excessive use of general antibiotics that were nonspecific and that just tended to wipe out, you ended up creating a population that has um, significant uh, biologic deficiencies. And that same thing, you know, when you think about children, or you let's go back to COVID for a, a second. Yeah. One of the things we should have really been able to do is stratify risk. Mm -hmm. Not all people are equally at risk of adverse consequences of being exposed. So we were learning as we were going on. So it became difficult to pivot from what earlier messages were because they were based on what we knew then. But a year later, we understood far more that when we look at the mortality popular, right, it's basically people over 60 um, is the vast majority of people. But then how many of those became exposed and infected by young children? Yeah. And right. there are just um, so many sublethal effects, right? Potentially. I mean, the, the disease has so many manifestations um, and it can, you know, we've got long COVID. Long we've got COVID. all kinds of ways that it can get into so many systems of the body. And so I would say, so I mean, one, I, I think that it is hard with school because of, of course, um, you know, that should be a um, kind of um, a, a choice that is made within mind, you know, who at home is vulnerable you know, what is that family concerned about? Or, you know, the child or a grandparent or something like that. What are these other risks? But then you do have to think about, you know, um, the kind of situation you're creating for all the other children. Um, and I think that the idea that we might have a disease-free existence is, is nonsense, right? I mean, that's not true. That's not natural. Um, they are there and we get sick and that's something we all share. We all get sick. Um, but I think that... In a situation like Dennis was saying with COVID, where we were learning as we went along and um, measures were changing, recommendations were changing, knowledge was changing. And that was such a scary situation because of how overwhelmed our healthcare systems were, how everything was breaking down. And to be able to reduce transmission in communities as much as possible was one way to slow that spread. And so I think, you know, it changes, it changes over time. 
um, what those relative risks, that stratification of risks might be. But again, the broader question is, you know, being infected and even being sick isn't necessarily to be avoided. Yeah. Right. I mean, so we need to figure out what's the right balance. Living in a world that is too clean, we're seeing manifestations of that in lots of different ways. So we need to figure out, you know, uh, what's the proper balance. And we haven't done necessarily a good job um, as we over sort of uh, emphasize hygiene in, in ways that create populations of people that have very little exposure to mm -hmm. microbes and all of the particularly for children, that early exposure and all of the potential benefits that they get from being exposed to things that aren't lethal, right. but they have a way of building up their immune system. So when something similar but more dangerous comes along, they have a much better, whether they're a child or an adult, they're in a much better position. Um, so it's a complicated thing. And I, we're the first generation that's gone through this process. Yeah. Um, and so you're going back to your point, we're a species that can learn, we can understand, we yeah. can adjust, we can adapt. That's right. Right. But we have to pay attention. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Anyone else have any questions? Yeah. I the ability to learn from COVID, the first time in the entire world, ramped up in the midst of these chemical or medical quick uh, resolve. And, and I think I like to think that we did a we did a reasonably good job of really a good preparation for future. Yeah. Would you say that that whole COVID was a great preparation for future? Yeah. Well, you know, it's 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 a hard question. Um, we thought we were pretty prepared before COVID. I'd say we in this country, right? Um, it, it, COVID was global and different countries had different experiences, absolutely, depending on how quickly they acted. And as I write, um, how uh, how much in solidarity, you know, or socially minded they were um, with those measures and responses. You compare Korea, for example, um, or New Zealand to the US or the UK. Um, many different differences there, but at the same time, different experiences as well. But to your question about, um, and I should repeat the question, sorry. Um, has COVID made us more prepared, better prepared, right? I think in some ways, yes. I think that the the science story of COVID is, is incredible. I think that the way that we had a, we had multiple vaccines, good vaccines, effective vaccines, in a fraction of the time that had ever been done um, was remarkable. The amount of data sharing um, and collaboration that we saw globally among researchers was phenomenal. Um, I was part of that community. It was um, in many ways reassuring um, to, to have that kind of um, spirit of being together in the problem. But at the same time, I, I do worry that this, at least in this country, um, COVID-19 had the effect of politicizing so many issues um, that should be, in my mind, um, um, unproblematic, <laughs> um, neutral, if you could say, issues about just you know science and health, um, that I think with those experiences, I worry that um, in the next pandemic, people will be primed for another fight, that they will come to it already on team mask or team not mask, you know, that they'll bring these ideas about what it says about them or with memories of COVID into a situation that is not going to work in our favor. Do you yeah. have an opinion on that, Dennis? Well, I, I do have an opinion on it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and to be honest with you, I think we're less positioned to deal with if say H5N1 or some other variant comes along. We were prepared and we had, you know, since two, the big wake-up call for the United States began with the original SARS 2003, but it was the H5N1 virus where um, the federal government really began to marshal an effort to better prepare domestically, but also prepare internationally for how we could best mobilize a response. In this case, it was to the thinking about an influenza 
virus, right? And from that point on, uh, domestically and internationally, uh, there was a significant effort to put in place a playbook in case of an emergency, break this glass, this is the playbook. These are the things you can do against uh, an adversary that has these features. COVID-19 had all of the, there was nothing really surprising. There are nuances within COVID, long COVID, for instance, mm -hmm. is something that, but the transmission dynamics, everything about it, and what you could do to mitigate, we understood. What we didn't factor in, we had lots of gaming, um, doing, bringing cabinet level um, discussions within the United States government and corresponding um, activities across the world where you you did gaming and scenarios and worked out roles and responsibilities, actions, what would be required, how you would supply a coherent response. What happened with COVID is that no one broke the glass. Um, it was immediately politicized, and not just in the United States. You looked at Europe's response. It was utter chaos when the COVID virus was introduced into Italy. That was mm. the first major introduction. It was every European state for themselves. So all of that thinking and planning for reasons probably more closely associated with the politics that dominated the teams, a rise in populism, fragmented the sort of the contracts, the social and political contracts, which had been part of the um, effort over the previous decade or so. But you can then look, you can go into Southeast Asia and the countries that we did the same work with, and you can look at the impact of COVID there and compare it to the United States. Sweep up the Philippines, Indonesia, Vietnam, uh, Thailand, Cambodia, and Laos population of about 360 million people. Same by and large as the United States. United States, 1.4 million plus died. Same population size without the sophisticated sort of health systems that, that dominate the United States, 120,000. And it's not from underreporting. When you go back and you do a lot of clever statistical work. The numbers are pretty reasonably accurate. The same as in the United States, plus or minus. The point is, when that virus made itself known in January and February in that region, they broke the glass, opened up the playbook, got the leadership, and they executed. And they used the measures that were available to disrupt the spread, protect the vulnerable, and essentially do what could have been done. And all of that could have been done here. My they also have a tradition for wearing masks. <laughs> they they had they right? had yeah. they had behaviors which made yeah. masks more usable, but it wasn't just the mask. They did, but they they also are a society that's less Rousseauian. Right, they're less individualistic. It's more about community. So they're go back to your behaviors and yep. beliefs. But it ultimately was about leadership executing and doing that. Um, but as I look forward and say, well, did we learn from this? It's worth noting that at least as of a month ago, 25 states in this union have passed laws which will restrict the ability of public health measures such as mask wearing to be mandated. Mm -hmm. So we put into laws things which are going to make the kind of public health impact that is essential now part of immediately the political legal framework. Okay, well, I think um, with that, <laughs> I think that oh, we and on a more positive note. and on a more positive note, um, <laughs> right? Leave them, leave them, um, give them hope, right? Yes. Okay. Um, well, in that case, I would, I, um, I would say that for all of the problems, you know, that 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 we face, um, I do think that one of the best things that we can do, um, is to recognize those problems, <laughs> right? Um, and talk about them and, you know, knowledge is power and the way, thank you all for coming out tonight and being interested to learn more, because honestly, um, whatever you do with this information, um, you're better off for having it. And I think that, 
um, you know, I'll, I hope you, you know, if you read the book, um, you'll find more in there about um, maybe uh, some ways that we can focus on on the 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 good qualities that are that are very much a part of humans that are the things that make us human. That might better prepare us for the future. <laughs> All right. Thank you all for being here this evening. Um, the books are available for purchase upstairs. We are going to take a moment to reset the space for the signing line. Um, if you are willing and able to set your chair, fold it up and set it to the side, we would greatly appreciate that. Give us about 10 minutes to reset the space and then we'll get the signing line going. Thank you so much.